Hello and welcome to Central Triad Church. Thank you so much for joining us today for this message. Feel free to take notes, put some comments in the comments section, and share us with a friend. We look forward to seeing what God's going to do in your life through this sermon and through this message. God bless you guys. We we'll hope to see you soon. I remember when I was a kid, and I would try to, you know, get in a room full of people, and, and sometimes I would sit quietly and, and hope someone would come be friends with me. Anybody ever done that before? But the truth is, people aren't drawn to misery. They're drawn to life, right? So when I learned that if I spoke up, said some things, joined the group, be friendly, everybody say be friendly, that, that I, I, I made friends. As a matter of fact, we're gonna, we haven't done this since 2020, but in just a moment, I'm going to have everybody stand up. And we're going to be friendly. <laughs> you ain't got to leave your seat, but you can if you want to. You ain't got to shake anybody's hand. You can if you want to. But I want you to find three people you do not know. Point at them and tell them this statement. I have been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. <laughs> Are you ready? Let's all stand, find three people, and just point out and say, I've been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. That felt kind of good, didn't it? To, instead of you getting a phone call, you get to tell somebody else for a minute. That's kind of nice, isn't it? <laughs> the Bible goes on to say, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So not only if a man wants to have friends, then they must show themselves friendly, but also the Bible goes ahead and speaks forward and says, there's also a friend that can stick closer than a brother. You know, being friendly is a very important thing. Uh, friendly means that people want to be around you. Do y'all know someone who's friendly? Yeah, do you know someone who's friendly? Raise your hand. Do you know someone who's not friendly? Raise your hand. Yeah. Do you want to hang out with the not friendly one? Not really. Not really. No fun. Friends are important. So how do you, how do you make friends? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to be kind. You got to be friendly to people. Here at Central Triad Church, we have a thing called central groups. What's the purpose of the groups? The groups are Bible studies of all types, all kinds of things that go on. And you find yourself in a group of people, four, five, six, seven people, talking about marriage, talking about scripture, talking about amazing things to develop relationships and friendships. You got to have somewhere where iron can sharpen iron because otherwise you, you become weakened and, and you're separated from the body and it causes there to be issues in your life. But talking about friends today, so I want to encourage you, we start Central Groups up next month in August. Get ready to get in a group. It's going to be an amazing time. Go to the church app, scroll down, see the groups, click on it. Look at all the groups available now. We'll have more available in the next couple of weeks. Select one, register for it, and be a part. It's going to be really, really a lot of fun. Proverbs chapter 17 says it like this. A friend loveth at all times. A friend will love you at all times. Mm. And there's moments in your life where you, you may be sick and tired of trying to love somebody. It happens. People can, can be frustrating. I'm not going to point anybody out. I'm just saying it can happen. But a friend, a real friend, will love at all times. I, I've been very blessed to have married a woman that I called my friend when we got married. But I really didn't know what friendship was and after 28 years together, I'm learning what friendship really is. At my worst, she still loves me. 
At my best, I'm just amazing. <laughs> but I have moments where she loves me anyway. A real friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. In other words, a friend can become someone that could be so close to your life that when you go through adversity, trial, and struggle, they are right there in the process. The, the, a matter of fact, I learned several years ago that if you have more than five real friends in your lifetime, you are truly blessed. Now, when I say five real friends, what I mean is, you know, the kind of people that if you call them, they would drive 10 hours to get to you. You may, you may not talk to them every day, but when you do talk to them, it is an immediate connection. You know what I'm talking about? And if you have five of those in a lifetime, you are really, really blessed. I know that in this house, over the last 15 years, being in this place and, and surrounded by such amazing people, there are times, I, I don't know, it's more than five. I know it's a bunch because I got people that if I called them, they would drive 10 hours to meet me if they had to. That's incredible to realize what friendship can look like in your life. And we all need these types of relationships to happen in our life. And they don't happen because somebody else made it happen. They happen because you made it happen. I made it happen. I stepped out. I did something. I said something. I put myself out there to be a part of something. I intentionally try to go to people who are being real quiet and, you know, set back and not really wanting to talk too much. I do that on purpose because I know what they're thinking. They're thinking, you know, maybe they're com uncomfortable. Maybe they're, maybe they're introverts. I've heard this word introverts. I don't know what it means. <laughs> I don't know what it means to be an introvert. I'm not one. I do have moments when I get tired of peopling and I close the doors like, okay, I'm done with everybody for a little while. But... People, loving people, knowing people is a journey. And every relationship you have in your life is both a give and a take. You're not going to have an incredible friend, one of those five, that you never give to. You're going to have to give at times as in, the, in part of the relationship so you have these friends. And the scripture talks about there being one that's even closer than a brother. Uh, Job had some friends. Job, you know, if you don't know the name Job, if you've never heard it before, Job went through the worst possible things you can imagine, uh, far worse than we know in this time frame of life, the things that took place. And he had some really good friends. But even his really good friends at one point in time turned to him and said, Job, you should just curse God and die. These were his five. Really it was three, but I'm just saying on that hand that these were the ones closest to him. And he had gone through so much that at some point in time, even his closest friends said, you know, it, Honestly, Joe, if I was you, I'd curse God and just die. Enough's enough. But this is an amazing verse in chapter 42 of Job. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he, read it for me, prayed. All the mess he went through turned when he began to quit thinking about himself and his issues and begin to pray for the friends, even the ones who said, man, it's probably just time to die. And then the Lord turned his captivity. And then what did God do for that? God gave him twice as what he had from before. When you begin to realize that sometimes our relationships are not about us, but about the person you're in relationship with. And giving to them. Pray. Can you imagine being in Job's shoes? You've gone through the worst you can imagine, and the people you trusted the most turned their back on you. And instead of hating them, you prayed for them. And in the process of praying for them, God says, now I'll turn your captivity. Now I'll cause you to be blessed. Now, once you've realized the process and the value of praying for those around you. When was the last time you prayed for a friend? I mean, I'm talking about, you know, that ugly cry. You know, you, oh, I want to bless somebody. I, I, my friend's going through stuff. I want to be there. It's a part of the relationship that we have that we're going to have these moments where it pulls on us. Even when we want, even when we're the ones wanting the attention, but it's pulling on us. Matter of fact, you have to learn, because we're all guilty of this. When you have friendships and relationships, you have to learn how to repent, how to repair, and how to restore. This is part of life. You're going to have people in your life. Guess what? You're going to make mistakes. You're going to say the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time. It happens. Why? Because we're human beings. We get frustrated. But learning how to repent, 
Learning how to restore relationships is important, especially if there's a desire for restoration from everybody involved. When was the last time you told your friends you were sorry for what you said? Or had to restore a relationship? I know today it seems like it's easier to move on and find somebody else. Just, just start over. This didn't work out too well. That's what happens in a dating society. A dating society dates so much that we get so used to uh, dropping one and picking up another that when we get married, it's easy to and pick up another one. We stop trying to be a part of the relationship and just, and just start becoming selfish in the relationship as if once you stop doing what I like, we're done. That's, that's what happens. And so being friendly is important, is everything. I, I'm blessed to have some, some amazing friends in my life who, who, who will call me up or, and I can reach out to them and hear things I need to hear and talk to somebody. But even Jesus had a friend who turned on him. In Matthew, you read about it here, whenever Judas tells the guards, he says, whoever I shall kiss, that's the one. Hold him fast. And he walks to Jesus and says, hell, master, and kissed him. The Bible says he kissed him on the cheek. And when he kissed him, Jesus says, friend, what are you doing? Why are you here? Let me help you out with something. Jesus already knows the answer to the question. That's not the issue. Jesus asks questions so that we discover the answer to the question. That's why when, when God asked Adam, where are you? It's not because God did not know where he was. God was asking Adam to recognize his current position. And his current position was, I have just sinned. I now realize I'm of flesh. I realize I'm naked. I'm covering my own sins. And God's getting him to realize what position you're in. Where are you? When God asks you a question, it's never because God doesn't know the answer. It's because God wants you to get the answer. To think, to pray, to seek, to long for, to understand how the relationship is supposed to work. Judas kissed him on the cheek, and Jesus calls him a friend. I think this is part one. And this is my, my thought. You don't have to have this if you don't want to. I think this is part of what drove Judas into that moment of committing, committing suicide, taking his own life. Because he realized he had just caused the death of his friend. He hadn't died yet. But what was going to happen next was the most horrific way to die. And he knew it. All for money. All for position. All for power. And so it drove him. He had turned his friend over. He had given his friend over to those who would brutally, brutally destroy him. Friend, why are you here? We all can have moments where someone can betray us, but how do we respond to it? What do we do with it? There's a story in Mark that I, that I really enjoy. It's a story about a, a paralytic man. It starts in Mark chapter 2, and it says, Again, he entered in Capernaum after some days. Now, Capernaum is the town Jesus was going to. Jesus had a house in Capernaum. He was there for many reasons. One, business. He was a businessman as well. Jesus was a, we called him a carpenter. The truth is, he was more like a stonemason. He worked more with stone than he did with wood. Wood is very sparse over in the Middle East. So they built their houses from stone. Everything was from stone. So it's no surprise to me that the stone rolled away. Hallelujah. Because what's inside that thing was something that He's already been working this, this, this stone already. He knows. And so he has a house in Capernaum, and he would go there between trips. And as he goes there, his disciples would stay there as well. My wife and I were there. We took pictures of it. I meant to bring the picture, and I totally forgot. I'm sorry. They built a house over the house. You can look down and see the house, this house where Jesus stayed in Capernaum. And while he was there, it was noised about that he was in the house. While he was there, it was noised about. In other words, word got out that Jesus is back at his house. And the city began to buzz that he was there. And word got out. And straightway many gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. In other words, his house filled up so quickly 
that it went, the crowd went out the front door, and then the crowd lingered around the front door, making, there was no way to get into the place because the crowd was so big, and they covered the entrance up because they wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. They wanted to be a part of it. Matter of fact, Luke chapter 5 tells us that at this very moment, at this moment, he's at home, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The atmosphere at his house was so powerful. The crowds had gathered. They knew he was there. They've seen him heal blinded people. They've seen things happen, and they gathered to the house because the presence of the Lord was there to heal them. And the crowds pushed and pushed to be in that space. Powerful moment. Let me tell you, when Jesus comes into the house, your house will never be the same again. Never be the same again. You better go ahead and expect God to be moving powerfully in your home. If you don't have that happening, you need to be praying for it to happen. Because God wants to use your house as a place of revival. Somebody say amen. amen. And then, verse 3, and they came to him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Four friends get together. And they bring their fifth friend with them, who is now paralyzed and unable to move. They put him in a cot, and they carry him to the house to meet Jesus. Four friends heard the noise that a healer, the healer, Jesus, was at home. And they decided, we're going to get together, and we're going to make sure our buddy, our fifth friend, the one who's paralyzed, gets to see Jesus. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is incredible because this means that there were people looking out for someone they loved simply because they loved. He's sick. The friend knew of the need. The friend knew of the need and heard there was an answer. Then the friend began the process of getting the need to where the answer was. Real friends will find ways to make things happen for each other so we see something take place. And these four begin to take a man that could not do anything and for him move him to a place. We need friends in our circle that will speak faith to us as we deal with life's greatest struggles. You've got to have somebody in your life that will speak to you when you're going through hell. You've got to have somebody in your life that when you're feeling doubt and you're feeling misery will speak truth and faith and power to you. You've got to have somebody that does that. Real friends, kingdom-minded friends can be life-changing. You will not find that kind of friend that will speak faith to you at the club. Hallelujah. Just pointing out some obvious things we seem to forget. Those kind of friends aren't there. You want faith-filled friends, kingdom-minded friends that will speak faith and power to you whenever you find yourself at your lowest. Somebody that will walk up to you and say, Jesus said you're going to have healing. Jesus told me you're going to be okay. God's going to bring you through. Have some way of producing faith in you. Do you have a friend like that? Do you have somebody that walk up to you and say, no, not like this. I'm not going to let you get miserable. No, we're going to pray. Have you been a friend like that to somebody? You saw them hurting. You saw them in deep need. And, and, and you, know, you felt the Holy Ghost say, go right now. Speak a word to them. And it's not always the words you want to hear. Can you imagine a paralytic guy? He's at home. He's laying on his bed. In walks his four buddies. And they say, hey, get ready. We're going we're gonna to throw some clothes on you. We're going to take you over to see Jesus. He's like, no, there's a crowd of people over there. Why would you take me over there? Look at this. I've been like this for a long time. Why, what are you talking about? You want to take me in front of all those people? No, I can just be here. But four friends say, no, 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 we're going to take you. Besides, you can't stop us. <laughs> You're paralyzed. <laughs> We're going to do what we want to do anyway. And they literally scoop him up, put him in the, mat in the cot, and take him there in front of everybody. And the Bible says in verse 4, when they could not come nigh unto him for the press 
that crowd outside the door that had blocked everything and they couldn't get in. The Bible says they couldn't get to the press. They uncovered the roof where he was. Get a visual image of this. We have four guys, friends, with their fifth friend in a cot. They go to the house. They get to the door. Crowd's too big. The crowd won't even let them through. Can we come in here? No, no, no. We're, can we come in here? No, no, no. Come, we're, we're packed in here, man. Go somewhere else with that. We can't. They find a way to take a cot onto the roof. Now, in my mind, I always kind of thought that, that these houses were just had a straw roof, you know, some palm branches, lift a couple of branches, you're inside. No, no. Jesus' house had tile on the roof. So get a visual image. You have a prayer service at your house. The place is packed. And then you hear a noise on your roof. Someone is cutting through your shingles. Are you still with me? They cut through your shingles and create a hole. Then they drop into that hole into your attic and begin to cut a hole in the roof of the room you're in. This is the level of faith and friendship these four people had for the man in the cot. Whatever it takes to get you to a place where healing can be found because we've heard of this Jesus. We know what he can do. The Bible says that when they cut the hole in the roof, they laid down the bed where the sick of the palsy lay, basically right in front of Jesus. He's teaching, roof gets ripped apart, and there's four guys looking in. Yeah, this is good. Is it big enough yet? It's big enough. Good. Good. Make that a little wider. Can you see the conversation? No, we need another two feet this way. Two feet more. We can't tilt him too deep. He'll fall right off this thing. He keeps teaching as they cut the hole, cut the hole, make it bigger. And now that it's big enough, now we lower him down. And Jesus is still teaching. He doesn't stop. He just keeps teaching. He knows what's going on. Everybody else is probably looking up, looking down. What's going on? I don't know. I'm still teaching words. You keep listening. This is something that's going to happen in a few minutes. But right now I'm preaching to you. I need some people to get a hold of something. When he comes into your house, I don't care how much chaos tries to come in, how much mess tries to come in. When he is in the house, there's peace in the house. Peace and joy. Can you imagine being in that crowd and seeing this cot get lowered down. <laughs> Here he comes. He lay him down right in front of Jesus. And then he does something that makes no sense. He sees the need. Four people have done all they can to put the need in front of him. And he doesn't speak to the need. He speaks to the greatest thing. Son, your sins are forgiven. Wait, I came here for a healing. But what I got instead was all my past being erased and washed away. Even before the blood was shed on the cross, all my sins, I've done nothing to get here. I just laid in the bed and they put me here. But when they put me here, you said my sins are forgiven. God does not just meet us at our needs. He meets us at the place beyond our needs. Sometimes I have in mind what I need. I need this, I need that, I need that over there. If I could just have that, I, it could be great. <laughs> How many thought you were going to win the billion dollars? <laughs> if I just had that, then I could do something great. You can do something great right now where you are by faith, <laughs> believing God for what he's doing. Thy sins are forgiven. When you live by faith, Jesus will not only meet you with your faith, but also step ahead of you to what you truly need. He speaks this word, your sins are forgiven. He does this for two reasons. Number one, the man's sin can be forgiven. Number two, to teach everybody in the room that he had the power to forgive sins. 
Now the scribes, they're, they're sitting there listening in. The scribes are right there behind him. And, and, and they begin to ponder on themselves. They're saying stuff like, who is this? He's speaking blasphemies. Now forget the fact we've got a hole in the roof. We've got a man who can't move. Now put in front of Jesus, and he's forgiven sins. Forget all this stuff. And just, he's speaking blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Duh. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, in one. The Bible says he robed himself in flesh and walked among us. Who can forgive sins but God? They're, they're saying in their own questioning who he is. But they're being so uh, attacking. They're religious. Here's the thing about religion. I don't do religion. I do relationships. Religion will drive you insane. Because you can never get good enough in religion. But when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, everything shifts. It's a whole different ball game. So I'm not here to give you a bunch of rules. I am here to tell you that if you will trust Jesus, something will change in your life quickly. It will blow you away what God will do. So Jesus looks at them and says, why are you pondering this in your heart? Well, what's easier to say to the sick of the palsy? What's, what's easier for you to say? Uh, your sins are forgiven or to say, arise, get up and walk? Both things sound impossible. What's easier for me to say? Why, why don't I just say this? And so the, the men are stuck. They're frozen in space and time. They don't even know how to respond to it. I think this is it. Nope. Hit the wrong one. Mark, here we go. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. The people are questioning. And Jesus looks at the palsy and says, but I wanted you to know I can forgive sins. All of a sudden, the man with the greatest need is having an intimate moment with Jesus. The man who needs God to move because he cannot move is now in an atmosphere of an intimate moment with the creator of the universe, robed in flesh, having a conversation with him. I want you to know I can forgive your sins. And then he says, unto you, arise Take up your bed, get this, and go into your own house. This young, this man, I don't know how old he is, we don't know, we don't know his age, we don't know anything, we don't know if he was born this way, we don't know if he was normal, and then all of a sudden something happened, we have no idea. Here's what we do know, he is paralyzed, he cannot move, and now Jesus says to him, arise. Everything has been set up for this man. He's got four friends looking in. We believe so much, we've cut a hole in this man's house. We have destroyed the roof of the house of Jesus. And now we are waiting for you. We've done all we can to get you here. Your job is to believe. Arise. And the Bible says, he immediately rose up. Then Jesus says, take up your bed. And I think this is part of the fun part. Go back to your house. You've done cut a hole in mine. Go to yours. But why is that so important? The man immediately sat up, picked up his bed, and began to glorify God. And the people said, we've never seen it in this fashion. We've never seen it like this before where you have such a major miracle take place. And now this man is picking up his bed and going back to his house. You would think the last thing you want someone to do who's been stuck in a bed for who knows how long is to tell them, pick up the bed you've been lying in and take it back to your house. You would think, burn the bed. I'm thinking, never touching that bed again. That, I'm out. I'm up and running. Let's do this thing. I'm done with the bed. He said, no, no, pick up your bed and take it to your house. Go back to your, why is that important? Because here's how it works. Victory happens when what used to hold you captive is now held captive by you. Mm. This is how victory looks like. When you've got alcoholism, pornography, addictions to all kind of things in this world, when you have victory from those things, they no longer hold you captive, but instead you have the authority and the power over it and you hold it captive. 
That's what victory looks like. The pull is not there. The draw is not there anymore. Why? Because I have victory through Jesus Christ. And now the crowd who wouldn't open up to let him in for a miracle, now the waters begin to part as he walks out carrying the testimony of his deliverance. Everybody that sees that man go from that house back to his house and for the rest of his days will all say, hey, hey, weren't you the guy that was in that bed? Oh, there was a time when I was in this bed, but I had some friends who came along beside me. They carried me to where Jesus was. They tore the roof off. They lowered me down. And then Jesus said, my sins were forgiven. Then he said, get up and walk. And now I carry this for you to know that whatever your bed looks like, he can set you free right now. That's how good he is. He can change your life too. You don't have to be depressed. You don't have to be miserable. You don't have to be all upset. You can have joy, unspeakable joy. You can have this. Victory happens when what used to hold you captive is now held captive by you. This is the journey of incredible relationship. John, Jesus makes a statement, John chapter 15. He says, these things I've spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is, he's all about you being full of joy. He doesn't want you walking around miserable. I don't like hanging out with miserable Christians. I refuse to do it. If you're going to be miserable, hallelujah, I'm going to the house. I'm not going to put up with this. I ain't got time for this. I'm going to speak joy into you. He wants us to be full of joy. It's the process. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me. I have chosen you. Look at your neighbor and say, he chose me. That you should go forth and bring forth fruit. That your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask in the Father of my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you. Here, here's the command. That you love one another. He says, I will call you my friend as you love one another. Can you imagine that your relationship with Jesus Christ is also connected to how you love your brother and sister? Hallelujah. Can you imagine that his relationship with me, calling me his friend, is connected to how I love Matthew? Well, I, I know you don't want to love everybody. I get that. But if you're not loving God's people, you're not part of the family. Are, are you still with me? Why is it people like to find whatever reason we can to, to be divided from each other and not united together? The fact is loving each other is one of the biggest things we get to do. Well, I just wish they would change a little bit. Then I could really like them a lot, you know. That's not loving them. That you putting down conditions for your relationship. In the kingdom of God, we're supposed to be helping each other get better and stronger at all that we do together. We're supposed to be the friends that would carry each other when we need to be picked up. And you can't do that if you don't love each other. I may not be able to supply the needs you have, but I can stand there with you and pray with you and have, be a shoulder you can cry on and be someone that can lift you up in the middle of the stuff. That's how it's supposed to be done. It's not a competition. Who's the best prayer person? Who's the, who's, who likes the pastor the most? Who, do, who does he like the most? None of that matters. None of it matters. What matters is loving the body of Christ as we're called to love. This is what we're supposed to do. And when we do that, he says, I'll call you a friend. This is everything that we have to have. He says he'll lay down his life for a friend. This is just a little extra thing. 
No greater love hath any man than to lay down his life for his friend. Understand something. He was talking about his death that was about to take place on the cross. He was not talking about giving people power to control you. It's not the same thing. If, if me being your friend means i got to die for you, that's not going to work. Or i got to give up this or give up that or do this or do that. To be, no, it's not going to work. He said, I'm talking about what I am doing for you. I'm going to lay down my life for you. Now, you can choose to lay down your life for somebody. That's real love. Choose to die for somebody. You can do that if you desire. But he's talking about himself. I'm going to lay down my life. No greater love at the man that lays down his life for his friends. What does that mean? We go to that point where he laid down his life. John chapter 19. He's on the cross. I won't go through the whole process, but I'll just say at this moment, he's not recognizable as a human, as a human man. He's been beaten to a point where he's no longer recognizable. Blood is flowing from every portion of his body that can be. Not a single bone is broken at this point in time and never will be. But he is dying on a cross and he's looking for something to drink. And they feed him vinegar in a cloth and he sips it for a moment. And when he sips it, he cries out one statement, it is finished. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his friends. He's thinking about the moment on the cross as he's dying, screaming out, it is finished. I have done what I said I was going to do. I have fulfilled what my Father has sent me to perform. What does that mean, it is finished? Tetelestai is the Greek word for it is finished. Tetelestai. It has three meanings. The first meaning is a business meaning. When Jesus said it is finished, he was saying the debt is fully paid. It has a court system meaning, which means the sentence is fully served. It has a military term, the battle is fully won. When Jesus on the cross said it is finished, this is what he was saying to every person that could hear. The debt has been paid, the time has been served, and the battle has been won. This is what it means to be finished. The debt of sin fully paid. The sentence for punishment and judgment for what we deserve has been fully served. And the battle against the enemy and all sickness and all diseases has been fully won. For those of you who have been healed by his blood before, give him a shout of praise right now. Mm. It is finished. What was required has been done. And now, all that's left is for you and I to understand and to receive. The Bible tells us that in Acts chapter 2, after, the, after the, 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 the wind of Pentecost hit the 120 in the upper room, Thousands on the street are asking a question, what do we do, what do we do, what must we do? And the answer comes back very simply, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. This, is, this right here is a powerful moment because here, here's what it matters. They called him a rabbi, correct? There were rabbis who would teach. And people who followed rabbis would get baptized in the name of that rabbi. That's how it was confirmed who they followed. That's why every single new believer in the New Testament church was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the rabbi who taught them. That way every person knew that from all around who you were, you were a follower of Jesus Christ. That's why we're baptized that way. It was a powerful thing to apply the name of Jesus onto a single life because now you're no longer alone. You are now, you are now Michael Shane Kelly with Jesus Christ. And everybody knew John's baptism, the baptism of repentance. The people who would ask about it, they said, well, we were baptized under what? John's baptism. Why? So that we, we have record of knowing that the rabbis were baptizing in their own names. And so now here they are baptizing in the name of Jesus. Why? Because when you apply the name of Jesus, now it's him and you together. 
It's a powerful understanding. As a matter of fact, that's the name of every name, the name of every name, the Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, going all the way to Jehovah through Adonai into the New Testament with the capitalized letters for Jesus, which meant Jesus is Yahweh, and Yahweh, Jesus, uh, Yahweh saves. It's the same name coming through history and time from, old, from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And he wants to put his name on your life. The Bible says that, understand that when this happens, that you can say, Jesus Christ is my friend. I think we forget this sometimes. I think we, we keep referring to him as God, distant, off in, the, off in the universe someplace. When the truth is, when you really know him, he's a friend. When you know who he is, he's your friend. Yes, I pray. Yes, I, I, I read verses of scripture when I pray. I, my mom wrote an incredible book about prayer. It's in the grand Central. You can pick it up. Called the Prayer Warrior's Handbook. No, no. What? Pray like a pro. Thank you. I went back to the old title, didn't I? Pray like a pro. And, and I, I use that book. I'll flip it open. I'll read the verses and I'll pray. But there are many times I will just talk to him like a friend. In the car, driving down the road, and just say, Lord, how you doing? <laughs> may sound funny to ask the Lord how he's doing, but it's part of the conversation. And then you say, well, it's been a long week. I talked to you yesterday about it, but man, it's still on my mind today. I, I don't know. And I'm just having a conversation with him. And, and there comes a moment when driving along the road where all of a sudden it literally feels like he's in the seat next to me as my friend and I feel his touch I'm just I'm just talking to him I'm not even I'm not even hallelujah Lord you know great is thy hand that worketh mighty deeds upon the land of man no I I'm just talking I'm just talking I don't break out the King James language I just talk to him would you please give us thou with us this this day? <laughs> Just talk to him. Relationship. When was the last time you had that kind of a conversation with him? Where you just sat and talked. It will change everything about your life. Now, a suggestion would be put an earbud in your ear. So people think you're on the phone. Because <laughs> after a while they're going to go, that guy's lost his mind. He never shuts up. He's been talking to himself for the last hour. I've been watching it. My, I've seen it. I saw it. Put an earbud in. Everybody, everybody leave you alone. Because it happens to me in public places. I'm at a restaurant. Oh, thank you, Lord. Yeah, Lord. I'm yes, things are going really well. Yes, Lord. <laughs> people start staring. Right? He loves us so much that he calls you a friend. He calls me a friend. And when I'm loving his people, I stay his friend. When I'm fussing with his people, our relationship is not the same. He's still who he is, but I've changed. He's never changing, but I've shifted. You ever talk to a friend that will tell you, you know, no, no, that's the wrong thing to be praying for. You, you, you said the wrong one. Let's pray for this instead. That, that's what it's like talking to him. Oh, that was, oh, Michael, that was good. That's a good one. I love it, I love it when I'm reading the scripture and he shows me something I've never seen before. It's like, what? Lord, I've read that 32 times and now I see the word and for the first time. Why didn't you tell me this three years ago? Well, it wasn't time for you to know that yet. I didn't know, Lord, that you... It's revelation. It's, it's conversation. It's a friend. The greatest friend you will ever have in your life is Jesus Christ. The greatest friend you will ever have. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. I've been married for 28 years, and my wife, I, I called her my best friend when we got married. I didn't really know what that meant. It was a cool thing to say. 
Oh, yeah, she's my best friend. Uh huh. And she's hot. Mm hmm. Yeah. I was leaning more towards hot than friend. Let's be honest. It's truth. It's just the truth. I'm, you know, I'm a guy. But after, after this, during this time, I've learned what a real friend is. She has seen the worst of me and still calls me her friend. She's seen the best of me and still calls me her friend. She's seen the, the skinnier me and still calls me her friend. She's seen the thicker me and still calls me her friend. She's seen me in the hospital. She's seen me on the mountaintop. She see me when I was on the, my face on the floor begging God for an answer that I could not get. And instead of walking away and thinking I was weak and miserable, no, instead, kneeling down beside me and beginning to pray. That's what a friend does. He says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, he said, I will be in the midst of them. I need you to know before I close out this service, when we eat hamburgers and hot dogs and play games and act stupid and have fun, I need you to know that he's walked in this room today. And I really feel like at this moment, if you could just for a moment imagine him just sitting down beside you. Now. What would you say? What would you do? What would you? If you just walked in and said, I see your hand. Yeah. You hurt that, didn't you? Yeah, you did. Yeah. And I want to tell you something. Your sins are forgiven. I love you. You know, we're going to have healing here soon. But more importantly, I, I want you to realize this life you're in right now is just a, a blip on the radar. It's a blink of an eye. I got some places designed for you. I got this house that I've been building just for you. <laughs> Wait till you see what I have put in this house for you. I told you I was going to go prepare a place. And I have. What did you need from me today? And all of a sudden, everything changes. And now there's a relationship. Does anybody in this room want to have that conversation right now with him? Just I didn't do this in the first service. But I feel like I have to this service, and that is this. If you want and you desire that conversation, I want you to lift your hand and say, Lord, right now, where I'm at, can you please walk in this room? Can you please just sit down beside me? Lord God, forgive me of my sins and wash me clean. Lord, I got angry yesterday. I said something I shouldn't have said. I let my flesh get the best of me. And Lord, you know that. You, you know that already. You've seen me. And God, I failed. And I, but could you just... And he says, man, no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friend. And I laid down my life for you already. And so let me tell you, it's because you've asked me. Your sins are forgiven. You've been washed clean. Now let's talk about life together for a moment. just have this moment of conversation because I call you my friend yeah I've seen you and your wife I know the two of you were really arguing the other day I saw all that I know all about it I'm speaking some healing into you right now because you're fixing to walk in that room and apologize oh I don't like to apologize but yeah you're going to go apologize you're going to repent restore rebuild He's not far away. He's here. And he loves us so much, he would take the time out of all the cosmos to be here.
right beside you. Right beside me at this very moment. Mm. And then there's times he'll sit down beside you and he'll say stuff like, have you gone to see Jimmy? You know, he's hurting right now. Have you talked to him? I want you to go talk to my, my friend, John. He needs help. I, want, I, need, I need to send him somebody that can become his friend. You know, I told you last week I was at a restaurant and I felt the Lord tell me to talk to a guy at another table. Remember I told you and I kept ignoring because I was eating my chicken cacciatore. And I said, Lord, can I just eat? I'm really, really hungry. I want to eat. And I kept saying, he, and he told me, talk to the guy at the table, talk to the guy at the table. What I didn't tell you was, I did tell you that the guy at the table started talking to us. I told you he started talking to us. I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm so sorry. I should have spoke up. But you know, you know the, I didn't tell you what he said. The Lord been talking to me for 20 minutes at this table to go talk to this guy. I don't know. And I'm eating my food, and I won't do it, and I'm being a little, little bit rude. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. And the guy at the table says, here's his exact words, awful quiet over there. Thank you, Lord. I guess I'll go here and talk to this guy. As he apparently sat down with him and said, tell him it's awful quiet over there. <laughs> God's sense of humor is staggering. Hilarious. I walked out there going, awful quiet over there. Yeah. Let's stand together. Oh. We're going to pray. Before we pray, I want you to know that when we finish praying, the altar teams will make their way to the front as fast as they can. And when they get down here, I want you to know that whatever you need in your life today, whether, whether you need to give your life to Christ for the first time or perhaps you need to recommit your life to Christ today. Maybe you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you want to get baptized in Jesus' name. We have a team here waiting for that as well. Maybe you need healing in your marriage. Maybe you need a reminder of just how much of a friend he really is to you right now. Maybe you need to bring to him the burden you've been carrying and say, God, I've tried all these things my way and it hasn't worked and I want to give it to you now. Whatever your need is, what does not matter? I want you to come forth and get prayed for in just a moment. It needs to happen. Your life will be changed today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, I thank you that you know us. Lord, I thank you that you love us. Lord, I'm thankful that you call us friends. And Lord, I'm asking right now for your spirit to move in this place. Sit down beside us. Let us hear your voice. Let us feel your touch. Let your power flood this house. Let revival break out, Lord God, not only in this building, but in every house represented in this room right now. Let revival explode at this moment. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm fixing to have the altars open. And God, I'm asking that for every soul that runs forward, for every person that comes up here for healing, that God, you will heal, that you will deliver, that you will set free, that you will save. Because God, you promised you would do just that. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. In the name above every name, we seal this prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.